taken the time to join me here on Facebook or Zoom, however you've reached us. A special thank you to CCTV, who's been doing this with me for, I think, the last five weeks. Um, they certainly have always known how important it was for people and communities to be connected, and certainly um, we are facing that time now. It, we are in week nine for many of us, where, where it's possible for those of us to shelter in place um, have tried to do so. For those who are able to do so, I want to say thank you. Thank you for all you're doing to keep yourself safe and to keep others safe by keeping six to 12 feet of distance and to now, as of today, for the entire state, uh, for wearing a face covering whenever you leave the house. For those of you who've been impacted by COVID-19 directly and have lost loved ones, I want to say I'm sorry. Um, I'm really sorry, and um, I, we are. There's a lot of people out here who are sending you a lot of love, and there's a lot of front frontline workers and essential workers who are working in our grocery stores for doing everything they can every day to make sure that we continue to meet the needs of of, the, of many people who don't have to leave their homes. Um, to my panelists here today, I really want to say thank you because during this very trying time. Um, where resources are clearly very unequal for those who are um, trying to prevent catching this infection and for those who are caring for those, um, the inequality in our, uh, our state and our country could not be more glaring um, in, in case it wasn't already. Uh, one of those areas where we know we have always had to do better is um, looking at the impact of inequity on education. Um, I'm joined here by a number of people who will uh, introduce themselves, but I can just say quickly, both myself and Aisha Wilson, who grew up in public housing in Cambridge and the first to graduate from high school and go on to college, we certainly know the impacts of inequity when it comes to education. And so we have a lot of folks who are working hard to figure out what does education look like through the lenses of a pandemic? Um, what does equity really look like through the lens of pandemic? Is it something that we can actually address? Um, my first guest I will start with is, um, many of you may know him, and I've gotten a lot of emails saying, say hello, Paul. I'm not going to tell you individually, everyone, who's emailed us, but um, there's a lot of um, folks who are really excited to have you join us. Um, so we will be joined by um, former Secretary of Education, Paul Revel, who's also now a professor at the Harvard School of Education. I'll be joined by John O'Terry, who is superintendent of Malden Public Schools, who also, in addition to his uh, many decades in education, also served a decade as a social worker um, on the ground, meeting the needs of children and their families. We're also joined by Susan Cole, who is also, we're so fortunate, not only is she a Cambridge resident, but who has years of experience working on the intersection of trauma and education. Um, and I wanna say a very special thank you to brand new school committee members in Cambridge, Aisha Wilson and Rachel Weinstein, who have not missed a beat and who've jumped right in to help us address um, the needs of children in, in, in Cambridge. Um, Paul, I'll start with you. I know that your time is limited and you'll be leaving us at 4.30. So, um, maybe you want to start with talking to us about what does education look like through a pandemic? I, I read a quote where somewhere you said, you know, in politics, we never lose the opportunity of a crisis. And I know from your work that crisis really means about addressing equity in ways that we maybe have struggled, um, that we have certainly struggled before a pandemic. But what does it look like now? And um, if you're, if you're encouraging and coaching everyone on this panel and, and parents and students throughout, and school districts throughout the state, what is it that you think we need to be doing at this time? And, and how do we really plan for um, what this pandemic might look like in the fall and its impact on students? Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Marjorie, for inviting me. I'm honored to be here. This is a great panel of people who have um, just as much to say as I do on these topics. So I'm interested in hearing that. And I apologize that my schedule is such that I can't be here much longer than 4.30, but um, let me jump right in for that reason. Um, I, you know, I think this is uh, this is one of those moments of of crisis. And in in Chinese, there are two characters um, that, that go into the word crisis. One is danger. One is opportunity. Um, we we're all way too familiar with the dangerous aspect of this in terms of health and the risk that uh, everybody in society is now running. But the opportunity is that it sheds a light on certain. Um, factors in our communities and in our systems for working with people uh, that otherwise might not get the attention. And suddenly we have a great deal of urgency. I've likened it to a, a tidal wave that has suddenly been pulled back 
and revealed on the ocean floor, you know, vast and glaring inequities, disturbing inequities that have been present all along, that have been parts of the lives of people, including our panelists who have lived in those spaces that are familiar to those of us who by profession have had the opportunity to dive down and see what uh, is going on there and how it affects, for example, students' capacity to come to school ready to learn. And suddenly these issues are on the front page and they're on the front page because a lot of people assumed that school was taking care of all these issues, that somehow school was this magic intervention that could uh, overcome all the profound inequities in wealth, in income, in life circumstances, in social capital that surround the schools, that make up the majority of children's lives. You know, children only spend 20% of their waking hours in school. The other 80% is spent outside of school. And they learn just as much outside of school, if not more than in school, but we measure it in school and hold schools accountable for the whole schmear. So we've got to get more. And, and, and when I returned as secretary to Harvard and set up an institute called the Education Redesign Lab, the basic premise was schools alone are not a strong enough intervention to take care of all these things that by default we assume schools uh, should be doing. Now, to be sure, schools can do a much better job of the academic education they provide to students. We spend a lot of money on schools. We can do way better. They can do better on social and emotional factors. All of Susan's work in, in trauma sensitive schools and things of that nature are critically important. But at the same time, until we're more attentive to these factors outside of school that get in the way of young people coming to school and providing their best attention when they get there, um, then there's no way that uh, we're ever going to achieve our aspirations of leaving no child left behind or having every child succeed. So it's about sort of thinking about what the architecture of that looks like. How do we do for all children what those of us who have privilege are able to do for our own children? What does that architecture look like? If you don't have the, you know, through the accident of birth, if you don't inherit the social and financial capital that will enable you to get a sort of longitudinal cradle to career pipeline starting in preschool, starting in prenatal care and moving all the way through to you get a job, um, then how do we build public systems that make that support and opportunity that wrap around schools? Schools are important, essential, central, but they're not sufficient to prepare all young people for success as those of us who have privilege know. So what does that architecture look like and how do we build it? So. I think this is, I've described it as a Sputnik moment, you know, in, in, in education, uh, when the Sputnik went up in the late 1950s, it changed our whole perception of US public education from sort of complacently assuming we were the best in the world and had nothing to worry about to, okay, the Soviet Union's ahead of us, we're falling behind and that makes us vulnerable and defenseless and we need to do something about it. We need a martial plan plan to change education. And we instituted a lot of federal policy that we'd never had in education before. I think we're at a similar moment if we take advantage of it. So you asked in particular what I think we could do. Uh, so there's several things that I'd say right off the top of my head that I think are important. One, I'd love to see incentives provided and support provided to communities to come together and bring all the people around what we call a children's cabinet at the Education Redesign Lab a body, it doesn't have to be an officially authorized body, or it might be, in which, you know, uh, elected officials, in which agencies that care about children, different divisions of government, um, philanthropy, community-based organizations, parent organizations, unions, whoever it might be, we assemble a reasonably sized group that uh, takes into account the, the, the holistic scope of children's lives, 360 degrees. And and sets to work at building that cradle to career pipeline, analyzing where in our community are the gaps and how do we you know, marshal the resources that we have at our disposal to fill those gaps. So that's one thing, children's cabinets and building children's cabinets. A second thing is, I think that we have an opportunity, particularly as we start to look toward next fall, where um, we're going to have to think differently about uh, our approach to children. We have, you know, a factory model of education. It's one size fits all. It's batch processing. It's, it's kind of herd production of education, which was developed in the early 20th century. It's convenient for adults. 
It works well for teachers. It works well for parents. It's a daycare system as much as anything else, but it doesn't respond as our medical system does, as even business is increasingly doing to the individual needs of each of our children. They're different. They come from different backgrounds. They have had different experiences in life. They have different assets and challenges at home. And until we meet them where they are and give them what they need inside of school and out, we won't get there. I, I contend that what we're about to do at massive scale in our society is a huge act of social promotion because in the schools, we can't afford to hold back massive numbers of children who have been given an inadequate fourth quarter in education because we can't have 14 cohorts in a school system built for 13. So we're basically gonna push all these children forward. And we know that every fall students arrive at their classes, some ill-prepared for the challenges of class, some very well-prepared. But now those differences are gonna be even greater because we know that in this crisis, um, the disadvantage have been further disadvantaged for, uh, because for example, of inadequate access to internet and to ed tech and to, uh, various kinds of supports and opportunities that arise from the home setting. So we're going to have huge disparities in what people bring to school in the fall. We're going to have to figure out how to assess that and how to make differential responses to the needs of kids that they bring to school at the time. We call that success planning. We're, we're in favor of the notion of having individualized success plans, much like what we do in our for our special needs children. I'm a parent of a special needs child. We have individualized education plans for each of them. I think it's time we start shifting in that direction for everybody. It doesn't have to be bureaucratic or adversarial in the way that IEPs sometimes are in the SPED domain, but we need to start thinking of them as individual people and not as, you know, e equality and equity are not the same thing. And so we need to begin to uh, sort of introduce that into our strategy of of interacting with children. Um, a third thing I think we need to do is we need to get much more active in reaching out to parents. For a long time, our school systems have said, you know, uh, parents are sort of a nice to do thing. If you get around to it, it's sort of incidental. Uh, some schools have regarded parents as almost a nuisance. Uh, we give sort of rhetorical tribute to parents as co-educators of their uh, of the children, of the child's first educator and permanent educator in the family, but we haven't really leaned into that. Now suddenly our parents are all primary educators. The children are all at home. And if one size fits all didn't work very well for the kids, it works even worse for the families. I mean, the family situations are radically different. So what do we intend to do about that? How do we build greater connectivity with parents as partners in the educational enterprise? And how do we give them support to the work that they're doing? And finally, the fourth topic that I'd raise for your consideration, I'm interested to hear what others think about it is, is just that, you know, the role of teachers in teaching is going to change now. And uh, just as I've talked about individualizing and so forth, suddenly we've been catapulted, whether we like it or not, into the 21st century era of online technology and online learning. Let's face it, as a field, I'm not talking about Cambridge in particular, but as a field, we've been reluctant. We've been sort of laggards in the adoption of technology for educational purposes. And suddenly, virtually overnight, we have to do it. And our, and our people on the front line have to do it. And we're doing, honestly, as best we can to patch together some kind of a response in the two or three months that we've had since this started. Uh, but really, nobody should confuse that with best practice or how other sectors <clears throat> or high performing schools who've been using this technology for a long time know how to use it. So we've got to bring our systems up to speed. And that means hardware, it means software, it means internet connectivity, and especially it means giving teachers the training and support that they need to get the job done. And we're going to have to ask for flexibility for our unions here in terms of doing this. Uh, we're going to have to have resources, I hope, coming. Uh, we, we know how challenged the state is in terms of resources, so I don't want to be unreasonable, Marjorie, in expectations. But if there was a limited amount that the state could do, 
I'd be in favor of sponsoring teacher academies this summer to help teachers learn how to adapt their curriculum to best practice in the world of technology. We need help in curation. I mean, educators, you know, people like John who's got a million things to do fighting fires all day long. And suddenly, you know, a, a million vendors come forward telling him, here's the best thing to do in terms of, uh, you know, what, what, what we should be putting online and the platforms we should use and the applications we can use and all that. We need help in, vet, in you know, in, in, uh, in vetting that and sorting that out and making smart choices and all that area. So I think that's another area that requires our attention. So um, that's enough from me, uh, Marjorie, that uh, sort of uh, a, a few provocations there. And let's see what other people think. Yeah, thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. I am going to ask Susan and John to also jump in. I think one of the, uh, a few of the things that you've talked about is that I think that school districts around the state are going to need more guidance and more intensive support and resources that's directed from the state. And right now, I, I think it's been really, um, there's this always this culture of trying to respect uh, local school districts and figuring out what fits best for them. But I think what we've seen around Massachusetts is there's a real discrepancy in what online learning looks like, not only from city to city, but from school to school in many communities. And then from teacher to teacher, we hear some teachers who are just, who have the bandwidth and have the ability to be online every day with their students, engaging for the purposes of mental health or for the purpose of, of, of instruction. Um, and then we see we've got, we're bookended by Rhode Island and New Hampshire, who seem to also have figured out how to do this a little differently um, before we have as a state. So I, I hope that what you say is where we had this summer and really if the state is, is putting its arms around all of our school districts and giving them the intensive support that they need. And I think it's gonna take a lot of patience of parents, teachers, unions and the state all, all together. So I appreciate that. Susan, um, people are worried I, about- just one, one footnote to that Marjorie, before you move on to Susan, sure. which is, I just think we have to avoid the error that has often been made either by the field or sometimes frankly by the legislature, present company accepted, which is to say the state ought to do all these things. And as somebody who's had responsibility for the State Department of Education, the state, like teachers, need the capacity to do things in new ways. So before we go assigning a whole bunch of new responsibilities to the state, uh, under the assumption that they have a lot of people up there who are just hanging around waiting for this assignment, we need to give them the capacity to do this work. I think it's both, Paul. I, I think I appreciate that. And I think you bring a really strong, unique position. There's not a lot of people who've had the experience you've had. And I think it's going to be both. The legislature is going to need to hear from the Department of Education and from the governor about what they need. And right. then we're going to have to actually give them those resources. But I think it's going to be far more interactive than historically maybe it has. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's an opportunity, as you have said. I love one of your quotes. You say, we give children shoes, but the truth is we need to make sure those shoes actually fit them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that's, you know, something we need to be doing for all of our schools. Susan, um, many people have been writing into us concerned about the impact on uh, student learning and on children's mental health and, and well-being. And I would say, you know, that there's a, I, in the parent circles that I'm in, there's a lot of frustration with what seems to be an absence of um, an adult engaging in students on a regular basis. I also know that our teachers and our, our adults in our schools are going to need a lot of support in this as well and are struggling in different ways. Um, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on what Paul has said and, and the questions that we know have been coming in. You have to unmute yourself, Susan. There's a great concern at the Trauma and Learning Policy Initiative about the impact the traumatic impact that that's going on out there, a real worry that we're going to be hit with a tsunami when students come back to school. And, you know, let's just start for a minute to sort of see it a little bit from what it's like to experience online learning for many of the families. You talked about the variability across the state, the variability within schools and within, you know, now, I would say classroom, but, you know, across districts and within different classes in the same schools. And um, yet we're dealing with students in various different situations, uh, as Paul was saying. I mean, we have students who are in essential jobs and work all day and then have to come home and try to pick up on online learning. We've got parents who are in essential jobs. We've got students who have to watch for their siblings who are at home. Um, as well, younger ones, older ones, younger ones. 
we have grandparents. We were we we do a lot of focus groups. We've been doing a lot of focus groups to try to understand what's going on out there. Western Mass was telling us how um, there's lots and lots of grandparents that are raising children who really don't have a lot of um, compatibility with uh, online learning and technology. We have some districts that are giving out Chromebooks and some that aren't. Some that are translating like Cambridge and some that aren't. Some that are translating through translating what teachers have to say and some that are you know, hiring others to translate, but the child doesn't get to connect to the teacher, you know, or the family isn't, if that makes sense to you. Um, and I worry greatly about students with disabilities, many students with disabilities, and many will be fine with online learning, but a lot of them that we work with who already had mental health issues to begin with, or disabilities like sensory issues, or, and, and, um, some combined say with ADHD are having a, a lot of, we're getting a lot of feedback, a lot of trouble accessing these Zoom classes. Um, um, a little five-year-old I know down the street who's throwing temper tantrums every time he has to be on Zoom because he can't take the sounds and, you know, and, and that's just the beginning, you know, and we also work with a lot of young people when we interview them, they're, a lot of them are just very sad because, you know, um, they're students of color and they, some elders have died. There's a lot of grief going on. So when you put all this together, what you worry about, or we tend to worry about, is the disconnection that children are, can be having with school, the school community, and their educators. And that, as, as Commissioner Riley has said, I mean, connection is critical. If we're going to start thinking about how to buffer the traumatic effects of all this, um, we have to think about um, um, issues around connection. But, you know, when we think about trauma and how to buffer it, we think about safety first. You know, do children feel safe, but physically, emotionally, academically? In order to feel safe, you have to have a relationship with the teacher, you know, an educator, you know, safe to learn. And what we're not, we don't feel we're seeing enough of is connection between the educators and the students. I was talking to one really good, uh, you know, person who's really trying um, at the administrative level. And she was saying they're demanding in one school system that every educator um, talk to each student three times a week. Like there needs to be that personal connection. And I know that, you know, if we're going to get to academics, the children have to feel safe, they have to feel connected, they have to feel like they still have a relationship and that they still belong. School is a critical community for kids. It, it's, you know, when you look at some of the problems that are going on with some of the students with disabilities, they're, used to being maybe in a program where the teacher helps them socially or the teacher, teachers, you know, I think one of the things we're seeing is how amazing teachers are and what an important role they play for our children. Um, and the loss of that is huge and it can be traumatic if we don't really think about that now. Um, I could go on, you know, um, but in terms of you know what, I, I think the first goal is to really focus on connection. I mean, there are districts that haven't even found all the families. It's not that it's their fault. I mean, sometimes, you know, families have moved, you know, they've had to move, they've had to go to different places. Um, they're in another town. They're still entitled to services from that district. It's not that easy, but think about the traumatic effects of that kind of disconnection. Um, and, and um, think about those who are being given, you know, even getting their special ed, but don't have the support at home to access it. Um, we've heard of teachers doing wonderful things like sending um, occupational therapy kits to work with, but they don't necessarily have the support um, for all the reasons uh, we've talked about. Um, and we want to think about what are we going to do now so students don't feel disconnected the way they did in Katrina, you know, and then they didn't want to come back to school. We lost the whole generation of kids there. Now, this is not Katrina because there the school was, you know, 
they lost their school, they lost their homes. You know, we don't want to go that far, but, but at least we can learn some things about disconnection and how important it is so that students want to come back. They're ready to come back and feel like, oh, I'm back with my, my peeps, you know, I'm back in my community. And schools are the community for children. I mean, we've got to support them as communities. So I don't know if you want me to stop, but I, I, I can keep going. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll come back. I wanna to try to get Superintendent Oteri in here, just as I know that Paul Rebel is gonna be jumping off in a minute. Um, Superintendent Oteri, I think that you have like the hardest job. Um, we, we've heard sort of why it's important that we get this right. We talk about this as an opportunity to really address um, what an inequity and um, different resources in our school families looks like. We talk about the importance that students, there's no substitute for uh, students for that connection with adults in their lives who are teaching them and in particular their teaching. And we know that the experiences of students throughout Massachusetts and throughout the country, but here in Massachusetts have been so incredibly diverse. For many, it has come down to the individual teacher involved. And then for some, it's been about which school district that they're a part of or which principal they have. It, it really is, everything's in flux here. As we move through the summer, um, I, I guess I would be curious to hear about what you think, what are some of the best practices that you're looking at? Um, because we need to figure this out, right? We, we don't have the luxury of sort of continuing to talk about it and not figure out. So there's the traditional loss of learning that happens for many students over the summer. While we know many schools are planning on returning in the fall, I also know, you also know, that many are also having to, um, even if it's not official, there is absolutely, uh, people are having to plan for what school looks like if it does not physically return in the fall and having to do both of those. And I think that that's, um, that's a lot. You're planning for a physical return, but your plan B is actually almost as more important than your plan A. Um, what, is a what does it look like to not return and what can you be doing and what are you doing over the summer? Well, be before I even dive into that, I, I think I want to first thank uh, Dr. Revel because every time I hear 10 minutes of him, I swear it's a graduate course in education that I've gained a lot from. And, and I think he hit on so many of the points that are critical here. Um, I, I think he talked about there's a, a, a deference of the state to kind of to push this back for local control. Uh, when this thing first hit, uh, March 12th, 13th, um, I was probably a squeaky wheel of saying that we can't treat this like a snow day. That, you know, well, Framingham got 16 inches of snow, they're gonna be out two days and, and, and you know, Malden got three, we're just gonna be out the one day. You know, and that was sort of how the approach was in terms of, well, if your community doesn't have a high incidence rate, you're fine to open it up and it's, we, we can't. That's not the way it worked. The only two districts in the state that could probably do that would be Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard because they're islands. You could shut it down. You can't shut anything else down. So we've got to start embracing this, I think, at the state level. Um, the commissioner has been very vocal from the beginning that this has to focus on equity and access. And, you know, those of us in the urban areas, equity and access are very elusive terms that we hear a lot, and we keep chasing it. And, you know, our analogy is every year we, we this is where the finish line is, and the finish line gets pulled each time. My concern is that with what's going on, we're furthering that divide, uh, the haves and the have nots. Um, you know, our equity and access has been, you know, I've got now, as of Sunday, I will have, I think about 3,200 Chromebooks out there. We've had a one-to-one -one at our high school, so we have 1,800 there. I distributed about uh, 750 in, in April, and we've done a final distribution this week, uh, which will put another 600 plus out there. So of our 6,700 kids, we have at least 3,100 devices out there, which is pretty good, not great. Uh, we also know that we have at least 150 families or so that lack internet. We've purchased hotspots. Those will be going out too. Um, so we're trying to get there, but then, you know, communities not too far from us have been pushing ahead with the curriculum. There's a much higher level of familiarity with their families. I mean, we have literally grandparents who don't speak English, who probably have never touched a device, are now caring for their young kids, their grandchildren, why their um, children are off, the parents of these kids are off doing essential frontline work. And, and it's not the glamorous, you know, healthcare, police, fire. 
these are people who are working at our grocery stores. They're working at the hospitals in the cleaning area or in the cafeterias, and it's dangerous, high risk, low paying work. So we continue to, you know, see that without really a, a state model that will embrace this. The state model typically has been punitive. You know, we're going to come back in a year when the accountabilities come in, they're going to say, geez, look at these urban areas. You know, we'll get bopped on the head, we'll get some support from the state, uh, and they'll send in two or three consultants and, you know, we'll, we'll turn the world upside down. Meanwhile, everybody else is on the fast track. So I think we've got to use this. I think, you know, Paul really pointed out crisis, that Chinese proverb, there's two words within there, the, the danger and the opportunity. And I, I look at this and I just left my administrative meeting of, you know, this is an opportunity. We've, we've taken this as an opportunity for our teachers to shine. We've challenged it. Now I was in there, we were, we were complaining and working, you know, when we meet with our union in the coming days about the very few of our staff that are underperforming and not reaching out. The vast majority of them have, and they've gone above and beyond. And I have the emails to prove that, that I get from our staff you know, and I'm the superintendent, I'm three or four layers removed from them about the connection they've made with those families over the weekend at night. Um, you know, there, there is, you know, we, we have looked at that as a fundamental building block, you know, just as I would in the classroom, the connection has to be there. You know, I, I've always maintained the kids don't care what you know until they know that you care. Uh, and that's, you know, been integral to my educational philosophy from the time I entered the classroom to, you know, all, all the different administrative positions I've had. It doesn't, particularly in high schools, they don't care how many degrees, you know, you could have more degrees than the thermometer. The kid doesn't care, but they, you express an interest. You meet them at their level and you guide them to where they, they should go. That's, that's what we need to do. This whole thing, one of the problems I, I'm very concerned about, and I know I, I've worked with uh, your group at the state house on is is what's happening with our abuse and neglect because we literally now have kids and families that are held hostage uh, and it's it in some ways uh, resembles every you know recent hostage movie where there's video and you don't know what's going on I mean we've we were very specific in our guidance for our staff to look for signs of abuse and neglect uh, to you know to ask you know probing questions. Um, and, and we've caught some of it, um, you know, as a former DSS worker, the abuse and neglect claims, you know, plummeted in the summer because kids weren't in school and they went sky high, you know, in, in September. Um, and, you know, what, right now we've lost, you know, literally a couple hundred that sets of eyes of mandated reporters across the state and our educators, our paraprofessionals, our daycare people, our pediatricians, all of these people are now out you know, we're not there supporting our kids. So we've got some real work to do when we come back, what that, whatever that looks like. And I'm in the process of commissioning a task force in Malden about re-entry. Um, we're gonna be looking for guidance from the state. I mean, my pitch has been with our superintendents association is this is the opportunity for the state to really don't kick it to the locals. There's gotta be some cohesive way and we need to start looking at the allocation of resources, whether it's technology or the professional development to support our staff, because I think right now uh, their bandwidth is very compromised. Uh, they're going because this is what they do. But we're reaching, you know, a, a point, uh, and I think the summer has to be the reset. And, you know, when we return, it's going to be with uh, that trauma sensitive response because those of us in the urban communities especially we've got a number of our kids who have tested positive a number of families that have been impacted we've had a loss of, of parents uh, our kids are also being seduced by the combat pay that's being offered in, in supermarkets too and we've lost a number of our high school kids uh, of them not being able to connect with their teachers because you know the, the supermarkets now paying an additional four or five dollars an hour and uh, you know, twenty dollars an hour to a to a kid to a family that needs it, it's a tough thing to turn down. Uh, you know, they're gambling with their life and their safety, but I don't think many of them have a choice. Um, thank you, and I know that um, Paul Rebel is going to be leaving us in a minute. Um, is there anything else that you would add in terms of where you know how do we spend our time this summer, and how do we really plan for both the possibility of returning, which which I will just say. 
day is a very slim possibility and then the possibility of um, continuing distance learning over the summer. Is that for me or for? I think it's a general for you because I know that you have to leave. So I want to give you an opportunity to, um, I, I think anyone who talks to you loves really, you're engaging and you inspire a lot of people in thinking about equity. And we're trying to figure out, I have school committee people here who are going to chime in in a minute when you leave, but are really looking for very concrete things of to address these issues in the middle of this pandemic. What does it look like? How do we spend our time? And what are the expectations we should have of parents, teachers, and students and, and, and school districts over the summer? Well, I, it's a great question. And this whole topic of expectations is challenging because, again, we're kind of coming out of an earthquake here and trying to uh, just get connected, stand up, brush ourselves off, connect with other people, then think about restoring certain basic features of common everyday life, and then start to think about pivoting to a bigger, you know, uh, a different vision of how we do a better job at, uh, at preparing our young people to be successful. So one of the things that, you know, I've talked in, in several ways about capacity, but one of the comments that I'd make about capacity are that district leaders, state leaders, um, you know, like yourself, Marjorie, and the legislature, school committee members, uh, superintendents, principals, need the space and the opportunity to think about these kinds of things. We need, we need kind of a container for these discussions because the overwhelming pull in the field right now is to fight the brush fires. What most immediately comes on your desk that needs attention immediately draws your, your time and energy and your resources. And if you're not careful, you will spend all your time sort of fighting those brush fires and nothing will have changed. We will have sort of inadvertently backed into the status quo ante, which is not where we want to go. So if we're really serious about people taking advantage of the opportunity that's presented here, I think in our various domains, be they legislatures or school committees or, you know, senior uh, administrative teams and school systems or principals with their, their team, somehow a container, an opportunity and a discipline for sort of futuristic thinking about where we go from here needs to be created. People need space and time for this. It's not immediately obvious. I mean, some things are. We can, I hope, move toward getting everybody connected to the internet in very short order here. Whether that, whether the state pays for that or locals pay for it, the feds pay for it. I'm not sure how to do it, but it's obvious that we need that. I think we can move towards summer being more of an entitlement rather than an accident of birth as we think about learning and enrichment going forward. But there are other pivots that really are uh, much more complicated to think about, changing the role of teachers, um, working online, connecting better with parents, and how we do those things requires thoughtfulness. And uh, so I hope that uh, we all in our own ways can create the space and the time and the guidance and, and support and expertise to have some of those critical conversations among educators, among parents, among community leaders, among policy leaders, and uh, so that we really make the most of this opportunity. So I'll leave you with that. I'm sorry I have to go, but I, I appreciate you. the chance to be with you and, and good luck in your work going forward. I'd be happy to be part of the conversation as it continues. I'm sure that we, myself, the panelists and the legislature will continue to um, benefit from your work. So thank you. Well, I thank you. Best of luck to everybody. Be well. Yeah, be well. Thank you. Um, so now I have with us uh, two uh, new school committee members from Cambridge. What a way to come into this work of, of service. And um, and you both, um, you come from a place of service. So this that part is not new to you. But I guess some of the questions that I'm getting coming in from, uh, I'm assuming parents are the concern about what they are seeing as the um, the inequity of what access and, and um, engagement looks like. I've heard from parents whose teachers are online with students every day engaging them to whether it's reading to them or whether it's the actual instruction versus um, some who might not be getting instruction, but they're getting directives from their teacher, so they've had work to do, to others who've said that are, their kids are done in 20 minutes, and to others who've had no contact from um, a, a teacher or an adult. And so you you guys, the the it's enormous what, what our, our teachers are faced with, what our parents are faced with, and as school committee members, um, I think the expectations are, what are the, um, how are you building sort of the, the guidelines and the guardrails for all of us? But I think that's what I look to the school committee is, you're, you're providing guardrails and, and perimeters of 
what we should expect and, and with some flexibility in that space. And, um, you know, I'll let Aisha, do you want to jump in? Sure, thank you. Thank you for that question. I mean, it's a really tough question, right? As we are all trying to tackle and, sorry about that sound, um, as we're trying to all figure out how to operate in this new world. Um, we have our teachers who are also caregivers. We have our um, administration who has responsibilities. And, and this is not to excuse kind of what's happening in terms of the discrepancies from one school to another or within a school building. Um, and I do believe that my role um, as a school committee member is to make sure that there is some uniformity here and to make sure that we all are thinking with a growth mindset of how we can really transform this opportunity to reach out to all of our students. Um, and, and then think about what are the shared best practices? Like how can we actually share them well and know that if there are uh, teachers who are in front of this and know how to engage their young people um, remotely, that we're sharing that not just across school buildings, but across our whole district, because that is wealth of knowledge. That's you know, that's how we're going to be able to really feel more confident in our ability to actually teach and, um, and share out and engage our young people. It is critically important that from this remote learning world that the relationship building that is normally happens within a school setting is, is often that we don't lose sight of that. And so it is critically important, like you said, um, Rep. Decker, that if there are young people who are not, who are just getting assignments and not actually physically involved, not, not excuse me, not physically, but involved virtually within with their class and their teachers, that they're gonna miss out on that relationship. Um, and it's been several weeks that they have been missing out and we know this. And, you know, we're really pushing on the, on the district to really come up with that plan to really identify what are the best practices? How do we get teachers in spaces together? And again, outside of their own buildings. So not just, all the kids at once, uh, all the teachers at one school just talking, but teachers across different schools, across different levels, having conversations that we know that this is really important. It's awesome. Thank you, Aisha. I've always said in all my years serving at the local level for 14 years, um, and I continue this, um, I think school committee members have the one of the most important jobs in public service and, and the hardest jobs. You're really at that nexus of tension of our great expectations of the schools doing everything and meeting all of their needs. Um, with, in fact, acknowledging what Paul Regal said is that, you know, kids are only in school 20% of the time, yet we expect schools to um, address 80% of their needs. Um, and so I know that you're both carrying that, that tension and, and that stress that parents and students and teachers are feeling. And I know that there's been an expectation, at least in the Cambridge community, to really see in writing, right? What is this plan? What does it look like so that we don't have to continue guessing who's doing what at which school or, or parents don't start wishing their kids were at different schools because of what they're hearing as opposed to what the district's putting in writing and, and, and pushing out. So do you want me to build on that Representative Decker then? I, I want you to respond to that or anything that you think at this point that's come up in this conversation that, that resonates with you. Sure, well, there's so much that resonates with me. I mean, like, I think all of you have said, I'm really excited about the opportunity of this crisis for what it means for individualized success plans, for what it means for rethinking about what the school day looks like. I mean, there's so much possibility, but to your most recent comments, just this morning, I was talking with an elementary school parent who was saying, you know, oh, I talked to another family and their kids getting two hours a day and we're getting half an hour a week. And, you know, so the inconsistency is real. And it's something that all of the school committee members, including the mayor who cares very deeply about education, um, are hearing. And I would say that um, speaking for myself, though, I know this is also true for Member Wilson and some of our colleagues, like what Susan spoke to around the connection and the relationship being the foundation is so important to us. And so um, even at last, like, at last night's meeting, um, we were considering a motion to require every teacher to, not every teacher, every child to have individual contact from a known school professional once a week. And so, um, and we heard some amazing uh, anecdotes from a, a few of the schools around what teachers and counselors and administrators are doing to connect. Um, those are wonderful and we are so grateful for the educators who've gone above and beyond and we want to make sure we're not missing any young people um so i can't remember if it was superintendent or terry if it was you who talked about reaching three times a week 
oh, or it was a you know, requirement and then actually I think it was Susan who talked about a requirement for um, educators to talk to, to students three times a week. I would love to hear more about that because I think the other thing that we know is coming and I've actually talked with Representative Decker about this before, is we know there's a mental health surge coming. Okay, so we're dealing with the virus right now. With the mental health surge, we need to get ahead of it. Um, we need to have that relationship. We need to engage. So the, the challenge has gone to engagement. And um, so I'm both interested in hearing from Susan about that, um, from the superintendent about how you are uh, training your team in, in asking probing questions and looking for signs of abuse and neglect um, from afar, which is not an easy thing to do, but such a critical, critical opportunity to support our young people and their families. Um, so what I would say is we have probably about 12 more minutes on that we're on TV. And then this continues for those who are watching it online if we need more time. But I would ask Susan and, and John, I think a couple of things that people want to hear more about. Um, you know, John and I, you and I have been on conversations because of a statewide house initiative that I'm leading on the um, on supporting and recognizing needs of victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. We've talked a lot about how our mandatory reporters are, are gone and um, the challenges of reimagining what a mandatory reporter is. And there, there's some guidance that's out in different places. And one, we need to make sure that that guidance becomes more statewide. Um, I'll tell you the other side of that is I got an email today from um, somebody who said that there's a parent with four children at home who's doing the best that she can. And in the, um, in the wanting to be attentive of, 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 as a mandatory reporter, um, what was uh, the parent was reported on um, to a DCF by, by, a man, by an adult, I am assuming it was an educator, who saw things in the background that looked like the child wasn't being cared for. And so the additional trauma and stress of that family, right? So when we talk about issues of equity, we really are going into people's homes right now with Zoom. And I can tell you as somebody who grew up in a two bedroom with my brother in extreme poverty, in um, my parents did the best they could to keep a very clean house. Uh, living in public housing uh, in the 80s was not easy, uh, no matter how, how often you cleaned. It was just the materials that were used. There are people who are struggling right now and still doing their best. So we have this line of parents who are doing the best they can, who aren't necessarily um, not caring for their children, being concerned about being um, being reported on and that line of people then not opening up like a, a Google Classroom for their students um, versus the real concern that many of us are having is that there is, there is going to be this mental health surge and we um, many providers and professionals do believe that as we open up society and whatever that looks like over time, that we are going to see more cases of abuse and neglect um, that are real actually emerge. And so, um, Susan, if, if maybe you want to talk about that, and then you also, Susan, talked about um, a conversation we had about every child needing sort of um, a plan of how are we going to actually look at this child and, and have a plan for what's best for them. As I taught very briefly through Teach for America, and I, I filled out IEPs, and I realized very quickly, oh my gosh, every child needs an IEP. Um, and I think that that's where we're at. But I, you were talking more about sort of the, the emotional and behavioral health of children as well. Well, but what we were talking about earlier and we um, is, you know, at, because every child's in such a different situation that this connection um, that really needs to happen between the educator and the family should could result in a kind of a profile in the sense of, this family um, tells us they need this, they need that, they work in the day. I mean, I think we don't know what all the different needs are. So we're looking at things a little more uniformly than, than makes it sense. So we need to bring the reality of students' lives together with you know this knowledge. So like in, in um, one high school, and I'll be glad to share this off, off camera, uh, you know, where, but, you know, gives out, for example, a survey every morning to its high school students, you know, and they ask, you know, yeah. how's your food security? Um, how's the technology going? Anything you need? And, and are you safe? No. And so we shouldn't forget to ask students, at least those who are a little older, um, is a way to do it. And I don't know, you know, what, 
maybe that that high school would share that survey. I don't know, but I mean, I think we've got to start individualizing, and then think about that now, and then going forward, because ultimately we need um, we need to expand whatever what we call parent engagement into something broad and different. And I, I know that the Student Opportunity Act requires um, family engagement plans, and so I wonder if this. School committees, for example, have any say in it, but I, from what from my perspective, as somebody who's worried about the mental health tsunami that Rep. Decker is talking about, um, I think we need to put a lot of energy into, you know, the connections as Aisha was talking about, but really developing it and understanding the nuances. As one district told us, um, you know, we put the money into some program where the teacher's actual words can be translated, for example, and left on a machine. And the other district said, you know, I wish we had done that because we put the money into, um, so parent engagement people who reach out, which is great. I mean, applaud both districts, but then the family isn't hearing from the teacher. And when we're talking about dealing with abuse and neglect during this era, it really depends on trust trusting relationships and teachers, um, you know, are, if they have, if they put in the time for that relationship, and most of them do, if they're given the time, are the ones who the parents would divulge in, divulge to or talk to. And I think it's really important to support that relationship. And I think, you know, Paul was saying they don't have time, you know, and, that also means the kind of infrastructure that needs to be in place for teachers to talk and think about best practices and what works for our district. Not just some best practices out there, but um, each, to each, each town can sort of think through and problem solve, you know, how do we want to deal with um, the upcoming tsunami? And there's yeah. plenty of those who want to help. And I, I really want to see some I don't mean profiling is the wrong word, but you know, plans at least say this family works all day. This family, this child. Is, what know. you're talking about are threads that are going to be true for every school district, how they right. approach it. You know, there's some nuances around there, but I will say that I visited a country um, and I went to this preschool and in the preschool, there was a chart of every child. And on that chart was everyone who lived in that family in their home and then once a month the uh, social worker the primary care doctor for that neighborhood and the teachers would get together and they knew what was happening in that family um, in that school john i, I just you know I, I can't even catch my breath when i think about all the things that's required of you to both support teachers and to ensure that students are being both engaged in meaningful relationship relationship ways which we know are really important and i know you know this um, but that they're also getting instruction. Um, and so I have a lot of questions here that I'm not gonna get to for you. Um, but I guess I would ask you to be thinking about, you know, what is it that you um, hope that we can accomplish um, and whether it's, you know, in your own district across the state or what are the things that you know that we can't afford to not plan to do over the summer as we head into the fall? I think what we want to capture during this time from the very beginning has been that connection. I think it's just what Susan has said. Uh, so we've, you know, been very strident with that. Uh, we've approached it, uh, you know, with all hands on deck. Uh, I think when I talked to you last week, one of my elementary schools, we have large elementaries in, in Malden, uh, 1150 kids, they had not reached, they reached every, every student but nine. By this weekend, they've connected with every single one. And, you know, that's families without internet access too. So there's been, you know, incredible efforts uh, of innovative efforts by our staff to do that. Um, you know, we've done very well at the high school. Uh, our connection has been good. Um, we've also established ways to establish that connection. We've used our counselors, our guidance counselors and our adjustment counselors, social workers and school psychologists to really loop around and be that additional support at the high school they've created a virtual uh, what's called the Zen Den where uh, we have one of our clinicians uh, in there and it's it's a drop-in I mean it's just what we would have in the school especially at the high school level 
you know, you can have anywhere from three to 10 or 12 kids that are in there. Um, it's confidential and they're, they're supporting each other. Uh, they know our kids' histories, our families' histories. Uh, I think one of the more concerning parts, and I hear the pain in our principal voices and our, with our special education uh, work support staff is with our very high need kids the pain that those families are in. I mean, some of these kids, you know, as we have said, you know, we've always said, look, we've got them for six and a half hours a day. It's, you know, we got them for 25% of, of, of the, uh, the day. What are those families doing at home? Because we've got two and three and four, five specialists with them all day. You know, they've got a BCBA, an RBT, they've got a, a general education person, a special education person, there's an adjustment counselor, there's a speech and language therapist, there's this, there's a lot of different, and now those kids are home. Uh, so what, what I've heard a lot from our principals is, you know, they've tried to make sure that their staff is connected with the family. Supporting the family is critical, just giving them some of the tips that, that have worked. Um, you know, some of it, you know, we, we run the gamut there with families who have just sort of like let them do whatever they want, let the kids be, and, and then others that have really tried to, um, you know, have that prescribed structure that has allowed those, their kids to flourish in the school. So that's, you know, I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges. Uh, and then I think, you know, that, that tsunami, that delayed tsunami that's going to happen when we come back, I'm worried about. Uh, I know I put uh, one of our principals on my reentry committee, uh, specifically because her background is in social work. She's a licensed uh, in LICSW, um, you know, and she's going to come at it from that lens. Uh, plus, she's got a, a lengthy history in the district, so she understands a lot of the the nuances uh, that make us different, uh, for better or worse. So we're we're you know looking at it to augment as much as we can. Um, you know, I think that in some ways we're we're well equipped because we're used to the trauma, but this is now going to be an additional layer of trauma. Um, we're also concerned. I think one of the things that a lot of uh, those of us in the urban areas are worried about is the transience that may happen from this. You know, the loss of jobs are, is going to force some people to move. It's going to also increase our homelessness as they double up. Uh, and what's that like? Um, you know, if they have to move in with a relative in another another community, um, is that relative stable and, and safe? You know, I think we, all of these factors, we, we sit there and um, grapple with. You know, it's been said that, you know, the average teacher is making a thousand decisions in an hour in a, in a typical class. I, I think online, that may even increase because you don't know. I mean, one of the problems I have with all these Google Meets and Zooms and everything is you miss the nuance. Um, you know, I don't know who's looking at who. I can't tell. I can't tell the body language. Some of them just put, you know, the video off and you just see a, the name or a letter. And, you know, we miss that. Um, you know, and then there's been some enlightening things. You know, one of our teachers said, you know, my kids who are the, you know, kind of the, the nudges in the classroom, they're the same way online, you know, and they, they're the ones that are, you know, doing the goofy things and, hey, miss, hold on, look at this. And, you know, they'll put the dog on the screen or they'll do, you know, goofy things. And that's been kind of reaffirming that there is that comfort level. And that's, that's made by, I said, that's because they feel comfortable with you guys. That's great. You know, it, it's not this stilted event. Um, I think it, it speaks volumes. I, I frankly would welcome that. And, and most of them do. Uh, they get it. But, you know, we, we've got to be prepared because when we come back in the fall, you know, and hopefully we do, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't even know if I'm optimistic or, or skeptical of it um, because the situation is so fluid, but we've got to be prepared for that. Um, we've got to be prepared for, you know, our younger kids being traumatized by if we have to all wear masks during the day and they're, you know, keeping them socially distant. I worry about the, the backlash of prejudice and discrimination. Uh, Malden, you know, is a very diverse community. We have about 25% uh, white, Asian, uh, Latino, and um, African American. And, you know, there's been some concern about profiling of our Asian Americans, but I'm also worried about, you know, the families that have had somebody test positive, that that will be a stigma, you know, especially for our younger kids who, don't understand that and we'll we'll make a comment or somebody say, well, don't go, 
you know, if, if they were sick in, in April, that there's a presumption that they're still sick and you can't be near them in August. That, that worries me. Uh, so we're going to have to do a lot of education around that. So we have about a minute left that we're on TV, and then this will flow over to the internet. To those of you who've been joining us, I want to say thank you. If you've sent questions and we haven't answered them, which I think is true, um, please uh, feel free to reach out to me and we will get those answers to you. The challenges are big ahead of us, and the real issue is that we come together and figure this out. It's going to be the needs of our children, their behavioral health needs, their mental health needs um, are going to be primary making sure that they actually are connected with an adult online. And that's been a challenge for a lot of our schools um, and a lot of our teachers, that they're gonna need to have more time connected with people than they currently do. Um, and, and making sure that teachers have the tools, the skills, the confidence and the resources and the support that they need in order to do that. Um, I, I wanna say thank you to, to all of you for the work that you're doing. To Aisha and Rachel, there's a lot of questions here that were Cambridge specific that we did not get to. Um, I am happy to um, talk with you, maybe provide answers to people offline as well. Um, I, I, all of you are doing some of the most important work um, that we, I think that society um, has always undervalued, but relies the most on. And that certainly has become more true um, through the lenses of a pandemic. And um, if we, we, we have no choice but to figure this out. But that's, that's just where we're at, right? And um, I think many teachers and educators bring that attitude every day to school. Um, but now even more so, I think it's going to, um, it's going to take a village because seeing schools as a silo, um, which works for some schools and some communities, and it goes against them, right? There's always been this tension of like, you know, we engage the community, we engage parents, but yet we are kind of our own island. And I think truthfully, the needs are so great as we move forward that I think the integration of looking at whether it's housing, food security, mental health, behavioral health, um, the truth of what we expect of our schools is really going to reveal itself along with its limitations. Um, I, I do say that one of the things Paul Revel has uh, discussed in, in chats that I've been on listening to him too is that it's going to be really imperative that as we're trying to figure out um, families' individual needs and student individual needs, that we also still forge ahead, that we need to keep finding a path so that students who can learn continue to learn and that we pivot resources for families who need more support and that we find the availability for those more intense resources. This is not easy. For those of you who are watching, hoping to find answers, um, I think you join all of us in trying to figure out what those answers are. But there's a lot of people working around the clock um, who are not probably who are not sleeping well and trying to figure this out. Um, I, I do know that we will we will get there. Um, and we will get there faster um, as long as we continue to stay committed and talking to each other and, and supporting each other and, um, and through a lot of transparency and communication. So thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to working with all of you in different capacities as we move along. Um, and to those of you who are watching, if there's any other questions you have, please feel free to reach out to my office. To CCTV, again, cannot thank you enough for all of your work in making these conversations happen and public and available to our community. And to my panelists, I, I wish you wellness and safety and um, continue to look to you to tell us what are the additional resources, at least from the state level, that you need us to um, be focused on to support the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marjorie, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.